Beck Bruin's professional experience spans positions in the executive and legislative branches of government, as well as the water industry with one of the state's largest wholesale water providers. Beck Bruin has served as a board member of the Texas Water Development Board since September of 2013. Governor Abbott designated him, designated him chair of that board in June of 2015. Prior to his service on the board, he held a variety of positions in Governor Rick Perry's administration, culminating in his service as director of governmental appointments. Bruin has also served as the government and customer relations manager for the Brazos River Authority. His legislative experience includes service as a chief of staff to State Representative Todd Hunter, District 32, during the 81st legislative session, and as general counsel to the House Committee on Judiciary and Civil Jurisprudence. Bruin serves as the des designated Texas Water Development Board appointee to the Texas Environmental Flows Advisory Group. He received a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Texas at Austin and a law degree from the University of Texas School of Law. Please welcome to the TAWC Field Day, Mr. Beck Bruin. Nice to be back. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to be here for the field, uh, field day, which included a field walk uh, this, this time last year. Was, I was reminded it was a little earlier last year, I think it was in August. Uh, but I was looking forward to being able to come back. I really enjoyed this event last year. Uh, it's the, as, as many of y'all know or are aware, the Water Development Board very, very much supports and uh, has supported TAWC since its inception to the tune of a, of a total of about $10 million in funding uh, that's been provided uh, for the program when it, uh, when it began back in 2004 and um, when I came onto the board, uh, the Texas Water Development Board in September 2013, one of the first votes that we, uh, we were asked to make at the time was to extend funding for the uh, uh, TAWC and I was very pleased and happy to be able to do so. Um, I felt like that was a pretty, uh, a pretty good forecast in general that we just got. So that was interesting to hear. Um, it's been, uh, to say it's been a, an interesting several months of weather, I think this would be an understatement. Um, of course, at our agency, we closely follow and monitor what's going on with drought, drought conditions around the state and what that means for, for how we do our business. Um, you know, May in particular was, was pretty striking. We went from, at this time last year, uh, that U.S. drought monitor map showed that roughly 60% of the state was experiencing some form of drought. Uh, fast forward to spring and May, in particular this year, May was the wettest May, this May was the wettest May on record, that's what I understand. And one of the stats that came from that that I think is just amazing was that there was over 41 trillion gallons of rain that fell across the state in May. You could cover the entire state with eight inches of water from that much rain. Uh, so it might not, you might not be surprised to hear uh, that we started receiving some phone calls at the agency. And I, I remember one in particular from a reporter who called shortly after May, when at the time that U.S. drought monitor map showed that basically 0% of the state was experiencing drought conditions. And the reporter said, okay, well, the drought's over. So what, so what do you do now? Uh, you know, what is the Texas Water Dome we're going to do now? And, um, you know, I, I sort of I took, uh, took a little bit of an offense to the question, really on, on, on y'all's behalf and, and on this part of the state's behalf. Um, yeah, I, I was down in Houston a couple weeks ago, and it, it is hard to talk about drought to an audience these days in Houston or in southeast Texas. Um, their eyes sort of glaze over and, and go, you know, really, what is this guy talking about? But, but, but... The reality is, uh, for, for many of you out here in West Texas, that uh, have been experiencing drought for, for many years. I think some would point to uh, 2004 or so as when what, uh, what a lot of folks believe is still the current extended drought that's taking place now again. And, um, you know, uh, tell, uh, tell folks over around the White River Lake or up at Lake Meredith or down around San Angelo that the drought is over. And um, 
they, they, will, they will take the same offense that I did when I was asked the question about, okay, drought's over, what do you do now? So, you know, the reality is for us, um, it really doesn't matter whether we're experiencing drought or whether it's, uh, we're experiencing rainy times. Our mission continues and remains the same. And for those of you that may not be uh, familiar with the Texas Water Development Board, uh, we've been around since 1957. We're a state agency. We were created at that time by the Texas legislature. And really since that time, we've, uh, we've been operating the same business and kind of break that out into three areas. Uh, the first of which it involves uh, financing. So we operate as a water infrastructure bank. And we have programs in place that help us uh, not just develop new water supply, finance the construction of new water supply projects, but also upgrading existing infrastructure in the way of water treatment, wastewater treatment. Um, we are also the state's lead water planner in the sense that we are tasked, uh, been, been tasked by the legislature to develop a state water plan. And we develop a state water plan every five years. That plan looks out 50 years on the 50 year planning horizon. Some of you might have heard or have read or, or and maybe even have gone to meetings or served on regional water planning groups. The way the plan is put together is, uh, is it's derived through 16 regional water planning groups. And where, where we are here, this area uh, is region O. And those groups, every, every five years, well, what, happens, what occurs at the regional level first and then it, it rises up to, to the agency level is those, uh, those regional plans identify exactly where the water is going to come from in the form of new water supply projects looking out 50 years. It tells us who needs the water, when they're going to need the water, and where it's going to come from. Um, a, a third part covering what we do, I would point to or describe as being the science, the science and the research. Uh, we have uh, staff dedicated uh, to constantly, in particular, monitoring and developing better groundwater availability models. Um, we are not a groundwater conservation district. Um, we are not the TCEQ. We are not a regulatory agency. We are really a resource agency offering resources, again, in the way of financing, planning, and science. But how that comes into play uh, for, for you in this part of the world uh, as it relates to groundwater is that we are the, uh, the keepers of the data that's used to develop groundwater availability models. And so, uh, so we're constantly trying to improve those models. The better the models are, it just improves the ability of, of groundwater districts to be able to manage the resource uh, the way that they need to. Uh, and so that's, that's a huge part of what, of what we do. Um, all three of those areas, I could point to and talk about how they how they support uh, ag in rural Texas. And on the on the financing side, um, if you took it's, it's since 1957, our agency has provided a total of roughly 15 billion dollars of financial assistance for, for water projects across the state. Um, if you took it, most of that is in the form of low interest loans. Um, we all, from time to time we are able to. Uh, fortunately, provide some grant funds for different purposes, but most of that is is in the form of loan. And if you took the, the total number of loans or commitments made in that time, most of those we can show have gone to support projects in rural Texas. Uh, so, whenever we're in the capital and the legislature's talking about uh, money, water, and where that money is going to go to, naturally, there's always a concern for those who represent rural Texas that well. The big population center in Houston and Dallas, for example, they're the ones that are going to take all this money. And I think we have a good, our agency is able to show and has a great track record of being able to show that, that we have uh, largely supported rural taxes over, over the years. And uh, when I talk about an update on, on our new financing, financing program, I can, I can point to how we, uh, we're going to have the ability to for many years to come. Um, this is a, an example of what some of this financial assistance looks like. Uh, drove through Rawls on the way here this morning from Lubbock. Uh, one of the another one of the first votes we took, I remember, to, as a as a board member, was in October 2013, when we committed a uh, a low interest loan to to Rawls for them to upgrade their, their wastewater system. It was about a $250,000 loan, but half of that uh, was offered in the form of loan forgiveness or grant. Uh, yesterday, I was down in Post. Uh, 
uh, visiting with, uh, with the Garland County Judge and some of the board members of the White River Municipal Water District. And last year, uh, we have supported, uh, provided them a roughly $2.6 million loan, about half of which was, uh, was offered in the form of loan forgiveness. Uh, we can get on the list and probably name several other cities in the area here. I know uh, Canton, Seagraves, uh, we can kind of go on and on. It's not just the, the ability uh, to offer, you know, some, in some cases, grant, but the low interest loan part is, is important as well, and I want to highlight that because uh, for some of these smaller rural entities, they may or may not, when they have to borrow money, they may or may not be able to, to access uh, money on, on the private market on their own. And so uh, a big part of how we provide a tremendous benefit to rural Texas is the fact that we have these programs through which small towns are able to come to us and borrow the money through us. But there are programs which we're able to achieve AAA rated financing. So the financing on it that we're able to offer is very, very strong. The AAA is the strongest credit uh, that, that you can have. But it's not just the, the credit, it's the ability to, to have it to begin with. Again, uh, the city of Seagraves, uh, based on their credit on their own, may not be able to, uh, to get the financing. And if they were, the terms of that financing just would not be uh, as, as good as they are able to get through the Water Development Board. Um, so the financing part, again, we for years have been able to support, continue to support rural, uh, rural Texas. We also have a, a specifically an Ag Water Conservation Loan and Grant Program. Uh, Cameron Turner was pointed out and introduced earlier. Cameron is, is the lead uh, person of the agency that oversees that program. Uh, we've uh, offered a total of roughly $100 million of assistance through that specific Ag Program over the years. From time to time, uh, we are able to, to put out requests for applications for, uh, for grants, for different types of projects that can qualify for grant money. Um, and of course, the fact that TAWC is a, is a long-term demonstration project that's been funded through grants through the Texas Water Development Board. Uh, as noted, that Steve Waltower is here with the North Plains GCD. Uh, their district has been the beneficiary of some grant funds through that program to uh, has gone towards um, a demonstration project that they're involved with, and I think they have a couple field walks coming up in the next couple weeks. Uh, those details, I think, are still being finalized, but uh, for those of you that have friends or are interested in what's going on north of here, uh, keep an eye on their website, and there will be some opportunities for field days coming up there. Um, I wanted to highlight some specific grant money that has, that has been made available that, uh, that has since been granted to groundwater districts or uh, GCDs here in this area that you may or may not be aware of. During the 83rd legislature, $3 million was appropriated to the board for us to offer up a grant for ag meters. And I understand that the word meter uh, can, uh, can be taken in different ways. Uh, and and I, I want to go back and highlight the point and the fact that I made before about that, uh, that the Texas Water Development Board is here to serve as a resource. We are not regulatory, and we cannot, in that way, we cannot find you, we cannot tell you what to do. We'll make that very clear. We're not the TCQ, and we're not the EPA. Uh, that being said, we have been appropriated money to offer up for this purpose. And uh, High Plains uh, Water District was appropriated, I'm uh, sorry, was granted roughly $600,000, for example, last year for them to offer up uh, to producers for meters. It's a cost share deal where uh, basically the district with that money is able to reimburse half of the cost of the meter. Uh, Cameron Turner, if you want to talk in more detail about uh, the types of meters that would be eligible or exactly how this works, um, he'll make himself available to you while he's here today. Um, we were talking last night about the fact that while this is a 50% a reimbursement or cost share, that there may also be some money that's, that is available through a program at NCRS that could provide the other 50%. So then and, and what could happen is that the producer could be able to, to get, a, get a free meter when it's all said and done. How this is a benefit to us and the, the board and how we do our business, I mentioned the fact that we are we're involved in continually trying to improve those groundwater availability models. 
So to be able to do that, we need to have the best data that we can have um, that can come to us through, uh, through what the district is able to report through the usage of these types of meters. Um, so that's the benefit to us. Uh, you know, I'm sure those of you that, that uh, utilize meters uh, have, have realized the benefit to, to, to you personally and your, and your business and how you do your job and how that helps you manage the resource. Um, but again, I, I, I want to reinforce the fact that, uh, that we're not here to tell you what to do or how to do it, but it is my job and having been appropriated this money by the legislature for this purpose to make sure you're aware that it's there and that there is a benefit. Um, we'd be there being a benefit to all of us for we all to take advantage of that. Uh, sort of the latest and greatest news uh, on, the, on the financing for other, on the money front of what we do has come in the form of a program that we call SWIFT. This is an acronym for the State Water Implementation Fund for Texas. Uh, any of you might recall going back to late 2013 when Proposition 6 was on the statewide constitutional ballot, which passed overwhelmingly statewide, about 70% of the vote. Now, what happened then was when, the, when Prop 6 passed, $2 billion was moved from the state's rainy day fund, or savings account, into this new fund that we call the SWIFT. And well, legislation that was created to form the program that was then capitalized by, by the passage of Prop 6 spelled out exactly how our board is supposed to manage this new fund. Um, I mentioned the fact that we've been around since 1957 and we continue to have both state and federal programs that offer uh, financial assistance. But now we have this, this new program and, and the new program uh, is dedicated specifically to projects that are identified in the state water plan. Uh, just back fairly recently here, back a couple months ago, July 23rd, our board was able to to commit the, the first round of financial assistance. Going back earlier in the year, we started for, uh, for, opened up the request for applications for projects to come in and apply for this financial assistance. And so we went through uh, a process of receiving applications. Uh, we were tasked with having to prioritize applications based on certain criteria given to us by the legislature. And then when it all, it all brought, was brought to the board on July 23rd, what it looked like on that day was a total of 32 projects in this first round uh, that totaled roughly a billion dollars in financial assistance, one billion. Uh, we were able actually, through our ability to offer multi-year commitments for, for projects, on that particular day, uh, just to, to uh, put it in context and the significance of this new program uh, as far as what that looks like in the history of, of the agency, I mentioned again, 15 billion since 1957. We committed a, a $1 billion for this year at that meeting, and in total, almost $4 billion in multi-year commitments looking ahead. Um, the SWIFT is, is meant to be a fund that is to, to, to last indefinitely, really. It's, it's, a, it's, it's being invested by what's called the Texas Safekeeping Trust. The way the program works uh, is that the board, we have the authority to go sell revenue bonds. When we sell revenue bonds, we can take the money raised to sell those bonds and then loan those proceeds. And again, I mentioned the fact that, that we're at AAA, we have AAA rating, which means that our cost of funds or the interest rate that we get on that money is going to be very low. So once we sell the revenue bonds to raise that, that pool of cash that we then have the ability to loan, we can gradually draw cash from that new SWIFT fund. And we move that cash over uh, in, in a way that we're able to provide subsidy and lower interest rates, for example, in these in those loans that we're able to make. So, um, so again, 32 projects came in and, uh, and were, were awarded uh, financial assistance through the program. And looking forward, we anticipate being able to to open up the window and start receiving applications and going through a round of financial assistance from the SWIFT, looking out probably once a year uh, for the foreseeable future. That's what we anticipate. Um, 50 years from now, the goal of the legislature when they passed House Bill 4 was to say, take this $2 billion, this one-time capitalization of this new fund, and leverage that $2 billion to cover roughly $27 billion of projects over the next 50 years. And that, those numbers all come from the state water plan. And again, the, the main point and focus of, of SWIFT 
is that it's, it is dedicated specifically to projects identified in the state water plan. Um, I wanted to, to highlight the fact that we felt very great, I personally feel very strongly um, that, that, that the program has gone well so far, that the level of funding that we're able to provide the demand for the program. Going back to the beginning of the year, we had over $5 billion worth of applications that came in initially at the beginning of the year that, that ultimately, uh, again, had to be prioritized and, and ended up at 37, I'm sorry, 32 projects for $1 billion. So that's where we ended up. Uh, there were projects that came in from around the state. However, we did not receive one application for financial assistance from the SWIFT from either Region O, where we are here, or Region A, which is north of us, uh, uh, Panhandle North. Um, a big part of that, I believe, is the fact that House Bill 4 provides that political subdivisions have to be the applicant for the funds. So um, when, when the legislature created House Bill 4, passed House Bill 4, created the fund, they were very clear with with two particular dedicated set-asides, or goals for our board in specific types of projects they wanted us to try to provide the financial assistance for. They said, we want you to spend no less than 20% of this money towards projects that qualify as either uh, conservation or reuse projects. And they said at least 10% should be dedicated for, for those that are defined as agricultural or rural projects. Uh, we did have two rural qualifying projects that came in and, and were, uh, were awarded the uh, financial assistance in that first round. Um, there was one agriculture project and it came from the, from the Rio Grande Valley. It was a, an irrigation district that was borrowing funds to put towards lining of, of irrigation canals in the valley. So, so here we are, the, the, the regional water plan, or the state water plan, and the regional water plan for this area tells us that the number one water management strategy, that being the number one way we're going to develop uh, new water supply looking ahead in the future for this area, um, it's not through building new reservoirs, um, it is through agricultural conservation. Um, so, what we need to focus on, what, we're, what we are dedicated to focusing on um, at the board is Take, uh, we, we take that 10% direction from the legislature very seriously. And um, I know that the fact that we, we will be able to continue to support rural Texas, small communities with, uh, with their water supply needs, um, through water infrastructure, either new supply, existing infrastructure. But we need to find a way to make sure that, that we can get some of this swift money, this financial assistance, and offer it to the producer to make sure that that ag conservation strategy really does become implemented. Uh, I, I, the first time I went in and sat down and visited with Rick Kellison and Dr. West to learn more about TAWC, I had started that, that morning in, uh, in Houston and where I was I had a meeting with city of Houston officials and was being briefed over, about what their water supply uh, planning was looking at going forward and, and I was I left there thinking, wow, they, you know, it's going to cost money like it will anywhere else, but the city of Houston has access to a lot of water. Now, they obviously need it, um, but there's a lot of water that they will be able to develop, and it's pretty much all going to be surface water. Uh, so I'm on a plane fly to Lubbock, uh, looking through the regional O, uh, regional water plan as I, as I arrived here, and getting a, a, you know, a grasp or understanding of, okay, what was surface water for Houston for Region O is ag conservation. And you know, what exactly does that mean? And how, how is this part of the state going to yield so much new water through ag conservation strategies uh, in a way that makes it the number one strategy for, for this area? Again, this is where the, this water is going to come from to, to take care of our, uh, of not just existing demands, but projected future demands looking out 50 years. Um, the state water plan says our, we're expecting our state to population to nearly double over the course of the next 50 years. Um, so uh, I was 
until I arrived and had the chance to really sit down and visit and learn more about TEWC, what it all means, um, you know, I left feeling better about the fact that, um, that there is a way forward in achieving those ag conservation goals that are, that are highlighted for this part of the state in the plan. And it really is through, uh, through the techniques, the strategies, the things that are being worked on at TAWC that, that ideally we'll be able to show and teach the producer, look, you, 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 can, you can yield more uh, in the way of your crop by using less water. And they can show you how you can do that. And so that's, that's just a win-win you know, for everybody. And um, you know, I want to be uh, careful. I hope I don't come across uh, as, as preaching that, because uh, I, I, I understand how it can come across sometimes. Like I'm, I'm the, the bureaucrat from Austin. Um, I'll try to make it clear that, again, I'm not here as a regulator to direct you in any way what to do. But, but I can tell you from my seat in Austin, where we interface with, with the legislature, and with the folks that are making, that are passing the laws, making policy decisions that will affect water across the state, the way groundwater is managed, for example, um, it's important for, for me to be able to go back and say there is a path forward. That, uh, that producers in Region O um, are adapting and are taking advantage of being proactive in putting these practices to use because they work. So TAWC is going to be it's going to continue to be hugely, hugely, hugely valuable um, for doing that. And I, I can promise you, as long as I'm on the board and there's, we have the ability to support the alliance, um, that we're going to continue to do so. Uh, I mentioned the fact that Cameron is here. I wanted also to point out Carmen Cernasek, who's been introduced as our Ag and Rural Ombudsman. Lauren Graber is my chief. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we'll be here for a while. And, um, we all work out of Austin, but we, we're on the road quite a bit. We'll make sure that you know exactly how to find us, if we can ever be helpful to you in any way. And uh, with that, I'll just say thank you all for having me again, and we'll be happy to try to answer some questions if we still have a few minutes. Yes, sir. Well, the, the process for, you know, thus far, the, the, the policy of the state in how we manage groundwater has been, has been passed or given to uh, groundwater conservation districts, the local control of groundwater conservation districts to manage the resource through, through permitting. Um, you know, the state recognizes, legally recognizes surface water very differently than it does groundwater. Surface water is owned by the state and can be appropriated through the TCEQ. But thus far, the legislature has, has decided that it, it, as a policy matter, that groundwater should be managed by groundwater conservation districts. So our, our role and involvement in, as an agency on the groundwater side mainly is to, is to provide, is to be a resource in providing the, uh, the modeling that those districts can use and base their, their permitting decisions off of. Um, the, the legislature has put into place um, a joint, what we call it the joint, a joint planning process with groundwater management areas uh, that encompass all the, different, all the groundwater districts and within those GMAs um, jointly create uh, desired future conditions or establish desired future conditions for different aquifers in those areas. Uh, our agency's involvement and role in that is mainly to uh, to be fast to be able to uh, sign off on the um, trying to think of the, the appropriate standard. Uh, basically, whether or not the DFCs are reasonable or the reasonableness of those DFCs. But uh, we don't have our, our role is not to say again that um, that you, you can or cannot. Do something, or you, or, or utilize your private property right in that sense. Any questions? Any other questions? All right. Thank y'all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.